To provide to loosen. The day of God is coming. The day of God is here. Amen. Let's stand as we're able to sing our welcome song. Singing. 
the world come in this place. Marcel will sing this third verse here. Every second. Let Marcel. dream together of the day when heaven ever won. A city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem. Where I want a morning tester, growing, sing every Christian song. Vincent Johanna. Uh, we're having some issues with our, our speaker. Fortunately, our, our online friends can hear us, uh, but we cannot play Vincent's pre-recorded uh, prayer, so I'm going to uh, lead us in this prayer. Let us pray. In a cynical and despairing world, O oh God, give us a prophetic voice to proclaim your hope. In a violent and angry world, O oh God, give us a prophetic voice to proclaim your peace. In a dismissive and disinterested world, O oh God, give us a prophetic voice to proclaim your compassion. In a lonely and inhospitable world, O oh God, give us a prophetic voice to proclaim your love. In a grieving and weeping world, O oh God, give us a prophetic voice to proclaim your joy. May we be so captivated by your hope, O oh God, that we cannot help but to whisper, to shout, to sing, and to enact the message of your reign, which is always coming into our world. And may our lives be channels of your restoring grace wherever we may go. Amen. Se le hace 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The word of God for the people of God. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my honor and privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, David Worthington. David Worthington currently serves as the Director of Global Relationships at John Wesley's New Room in Bristol, England. If y'all need a little Methodist history refresher, John Wesley's New Room was built in 1739 by John Wesley and is the first Methodist building in the world. David has worked with the New Room in various capacities since 2006 when he was appointed its manager. He is a well-known speaker here in the States and has given talks to over 80 churches, seminaries, museums, and Methodist heritage sites across 20 states. In 2017, he was named director of John Wesley's New Room, and in this role, he gave over 500 talks to persons attending and touring the historic space. He is an enthusiastic and effective communicator and respected speaker. In 2022, David was appointed as Director of Global Relationships at John Wesley's New Room in order to allow him to focus on raising awareness and understanding of the work and the ministry of this building. I first encountered, whoop, there it is, I first encountered David when I visited John Wesley's New Room in the summer of 2022. He told the story of John Wesley's first trip to Bristol in 1739, a story that I had heard easily a dozen times. But sitting in this historic space, hearing David read from John Wesley's journal, and listening to his unique and beautiful contextualization of Wesley's experience in Bristol, well, you might say it strangely warmed my heart. David, it is an honor to welcome you here to Drew Theological, Theological School and as a guest of the General Commission on Archives and History. Thank you. Let's welcome David. Thank you, Ashley, for such a lovely introduction. Better be good now, hadn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Can you guys understand me? Is the accent a barrier in any way, shape, or form? No? Okay. Well, I'll just keep going anyway. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I wanted to begin, first of all, by just reflecting on a sermon title, I Look Upon All the World as My Parish. We know that John Wesley was an eminently quotable man, um, and perhaps one of his most famous quotes is that exact one, I look upon all the world as my parish. What I will share with you during the course of what I'm going to share with you this morning is the context of that quote and uh, why I think it's so important to recognize why it was said and to whom it was said. But let me begin, first of all, by taking you back to January of 1739 to the city of Bristol. Bristol was the second city in England, second only to London in terms of influence and power. Uh, it was very much a trading city, a maritime city. Much of Bristol built its wealth on what was coming back from what were then, of course, the colonies. Um, and in that sense, Bristol was a very influential city. A certain gentleman by the name of George Whitfield, I'm guessing some of you will know that name. If not, then you really do need to book up for one of uh, <laughs> Ashley's courses, yeah? Yeah, okay, right, okay. George Whitfield, we've got the context, that's fine. Well, George Whitfield was in the city of Bristol. He would originally from a city called Gloucester, which is about 30 miles north of Bristol. And he was in the city because he was trying to raise funds, because he wanted to return to Savannah, Georgia, where he wanted to build an orphanage. Let me ask you this question. How would you respond if you received a letter from George Whitfield with these words? There is a glorious door that is opened. You must come and water what God has enabled me to plant. 
How would we respond to that? Well, this was John Wesley's response. George, I still feel I have a ministry to return to America, to preach to the savages. Were you expecting that re reply? <laughs> Probably not. Isn't it interesting? We often reflect on John Wesley's time in America as perhaps not being the most successful part of his ministry, and yet here he fell, so he still had work to do. Well, George's reply to John, I think, is fantastic. He says, there's no need for you to go all the way to America, John, to preach to the savages. There are plenty of them here in the city of Bristol. <laughs> well, I don't get offended by that quote. I'm not from the city of Bristol originally. Uh, I'd like to consider, consider myself an adopted son of the city. Uh, my two children were born in the city, but uh, I'm not originally from the city. So it doesn't offend me that George spoke in those ways. Well... Let's just share a little bit more about that story about John Wesley's arrival in the city of Bristol that Ashley has just alluded to. As I'm sure many of you are aware, John Wesley kept a diary and then subsequently a journal that was published on a regular basis. And in that sense, he's often referred to as the man who was his own biographer. And you can learn a lot by reading those words. And the words that Ashley alluded to um, are ones which I'll share in a wider context here now. Uh, John did eventually agreed to go to the city of Bristol um, and he was there and arrived at the end of March 1739 and I'm going to read his journal entry for that day and just reflect on these words and the power of them not the first sentence that's a bit dull he says in the evening I reached Bristol and met Mr. Wetfield there well that's pretty straightforward isn't it here comes the really interesting stuff I could scarce reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields of which he set me an example on Sunday. Now just remember that both John and George were ordained Anglican ministers. This was not the thing for an Anglican minister to do. If you wanted to hear the word of God being preached, you went in to the house of God. He continues, I had been all my life all my life, how old was John in 1739? He was 36 years old. All my life, and then he puts in brackets, till very lately. So tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. Just going to leave that a minute. The saving of souls almost a sin if not been done in a church. Is that something for us to reflect on today? Welcome. Come into our church. Engage with us. We'd love to share with you guys. Do you think we need to go out into the fields? Sunday 1st of April, 1739. In the evening, Mr. Whitfield being gone, he had then returned to London. Of course, he then set off to Savannah, Georgia. I began expounding our Lord's Sermon on the Mount to a little society which was accustomed to meet once or twice a week in Nicholas Street. There were already nonconformist religious societies meeting in the city of Bristol. The Methodists were not the first nonconformists. That's why George talks about there being a glorious door opened. You must come and water what God has enabled me to plant. If you think that's powerful stuff, let's get to the next day, all right? This is going to blow your socks off. Well, not literally, but, you know, reflect on it. Monday, the 2nd of April, 1739, at four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile. Now you know why Ashley keeps talking about being more vile. She's following Wesley's words. I submitted. I didn't agree to. I didn't think it was a good idea. I submitted. Are we prepared to submit what God has called us to? To be more vile and proclaimed in the highways, not the churches, the highways, the glad tidings of salvation. Speaking from little eminence in a ground adjoining the city to about 3,000 people. Do you think you're going to get many churches in any city that can accommodate 3,000 people?
The scripture on which I spoke was this, and those are the words from Luke, which we've heard just shortly. Of course, those words are taken from that wider context of Jesus essentially being rejected at Nazareth, including that verse 24, in which Jesus states, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And I would respectfully put forward the case, there are parallels between John Wesley being refused access, for example, to the church at St. Andrew's in Epworth, where, of course, he eventually had to preach on his father's tomb. I suspect many of you may be familiar with various drawings that have been put together of that. The only reason he was able to do that is because that was a Wesley family-owned plot, and therefore John could do that. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has appointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. What did John Wesley come to do? To share the gospel. But the good news to the poor. I think it is significant that he chooses this passage from Luke. To the poor. Bristol was a rich city. Merchants were very affluent indeed. Bristol had grown very rich from the slave trade, from the monies coming in from cottons and tobacco, sugars from the colonies as well as the Caribbean. And yet there he is. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm a bit taller than the previous speaker, aren't I? <laughs> Bono never has this problem, does he? <laughs> oh no, he's only five foot, yeah, okay. To the, to the poor, he has set me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. In other words, to reach out and to engage with sections of society that people did not want to engage with. Just want to share these words with you uh, from Daryl Gwaltney at Belmont University, Nashville, Tennessee. Poverty not only reflects a lack of resources, but it also reflects the inability to make choices with one's life. It reflects the power and domination cities that some individuals have over other individuals, a kind of power and domination that removes life choices. When Jesus stands before the synagogue and announces he will bring good news to the poor, he is effectively saying that he will give them the opportunity to make choices with their lives. The lives they live now will have the option, the option of relationship and participation in the kingdom of God. Powerful words. What's our engagement with the poor, the disenfranchised? That's where Wesley's preached out. He didn't go and try and identify the rich people that could keep the, the church doors open, the buildings lit, heated. He went and engaged with the poorest, the most difficult to reach in society. So therefore, we do not have the luxury of saying, the poor need Jesus. It's a great phrase, but what does it mean? The poor also need jobs. They need food. They need health care and dignity. They need education and hope. That's what John Wesley gave to those miners and others in the city of Bristol in 1739. That's why they responded to his work and his ministry. That's why he needed to build a new room. Because it wasn't built as a preaching house, it was built as a meeting house. It was a place in which there was practical help and support as well as education being offered. And in that sense, if we think that we use our buildings for multi-purpose use, Guys, we didn't come up with that idea. That is not unique, all right? Trust me, if you know anything about Methodism, you know that it can use its buildings for all sorts of purposes. Just going to quote a little bit more from a John Wesley sermon on visiting the sick. One great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they seldom visit them. Hence it is that according to the common observation, one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then plead their voluntary ignorance as excuses for their hardness of heart. Challenging words, I'm sure you would agree. Well, what did John Wesley do in the city of Bristol? He reached out and he engaged with the poor. He found ways to offer food banks, education, health care, it always amazes me as I travel around the US, you know, how many hospitals, how many education facilities have Methodist in them in some way. Even the driver who brought me over here today, you know, a, a New York resident, you know, born and bred in the state of New York, 
and says to me, um, there's a park near me called Asbury. Is that any way connected with the Methodists? <laughs> what can I say? Yes, my brother. Absolutely it is, you know. Did Bruce Springsteen know when he called his first title, Greetings from Asbury Park? <laughs> I'll have a word with Bruce and just make sure he understands the significance of why he chose that. I just want to share these words from uh, a Methodist writer who I'm sure many of you know, and you may have heard some of these before, but I, I do think it, it's significant I share these with you from Diana Butler Bass. Methodism began as a spiritual movement to renew a decaying institutional church. Folks, I'm not pointing a finger. I'm just quoting these words. That is being mischievous, isn't it? <laughs> and serve the outcast, the marginalized, and the poor. It is messy. Based in small groups, empowered women, gave enslaved persons a sense of freedom, created a vision of justice and liberation. Anybody up for that? I said, is anybody up for that? Yes, yes? yes? Come on, folks, let's have some affirmation here. Yes. <laughs> wow, come on. The deepest Methodist identity is that of hearts on fire with love, of risk and rebellion. What was the last risk you took? When was the last time you were a rebel? Of holy revolutions, of challenging those in ecclesiastical authority, such as Anglican bishops, who criticized and chastised John Wesley and the early Methodists. We must remember John Wesley did not seek to start a church. He wanted to renew a church that was becoming narrow, moralistic, and cold. If any of those words strike any sense in which, mm, folks, we've got work to do. He wanted to renew it through a new heart, a courageous spirit, community that included the least and the unwanted, and a passion for Jesus. Holy mischief is a phrase that's coming around at the moment. Anybody heard it? Maybe that's something for us to think about. I look upon all the world as my parish. Well, where does that come from? I hear you cry, David. Well, let me share with you. <laughs> I do hear you cry that, yeah? <laughs> One of the first people that John Wesley ran into trouble with was the Bishop of Bristol, the head of the Anglican community in the city. He wrote to John and said, why are you here? You have no commission to be in my diocese. My best advice to you, therefore, is to go. I'm pleased to say we do have a better relationship with the Bishop of Bristol today. <laughs> but even so, what challenging words. John Wesley, how does he reply? I look upon all the world as my parish. Thus far, I mean that in whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet, right, and my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. Here is the stinger here, folks. This is the work which I know God has called me to, and sure I am that his blessings attend it. Great encouragement have I therefore to be faithful in fulfilling the work God has given me to do. Now, I can't speak for anybody else here today other than myself. But is that a question that we should be asking ourselves regularly? Am I being faithful to what God has called me to? So, as in any good sermon, I'm going to conclude with three points. <laughs> Who loves a cliche? First of all, folks, prepare to be uncomfortable. Submit to be more vile. Harness the power of God. Another eminent quote, the best of all is that God is with us. And go beyond having your heart strangely warmed. Great experience, but what are you going to do with it? Let it catch on fire with love. Then you're going to do something. And in that sense, reflect on Wesley's covenant prayer. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will and rank me with whom you will. That's what John Wesley did when he arrived in the city of Bristol, 1739. That's what underpins John Wesley's ministry from that point onwards. 
Of course, I'm rather biased, but I would say that essentially what happens in the city of Bristol defines the early Methodist movement and things that have happened sub subsequently. People often ask me, what would John Wesley think today? Folks, good question, but that's not the question. The question is, what are we doing with that legacy today? It's not John or Charles's responsibility to fix our problems today. It's our responsibility. So how are we involved in dealing with that? Yes, we can take lessons from the past and the way that the Wesleys behaved. Of course we can. But folks, it's down to us. Are we prepared to be more violent to do that? Now, I've quoted a lot of John Wesley during the course of this sermon. Of course, who doesn't love a John Wesley quote? But I must end with Charles. Charles, the great forgotten man of Methodism. And yet so many people came to faith because of that beautiful hymnody. Do not underestimate the power of Charles's words. Many people in the 18th century were unable to read and write. No point giving them a hymn book. So how did they learn their gospel? They took it into their hearts. And they sang it. And they sang it lustily. Yeah? So let's just finish by reflecting on the words of the first two verses from Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I'm sure we've sung it many, many times in our lives. But let's just slowly go through those words. And maybe the next time we sing it, it might have an even greater impact. Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. How enthusiastic are we about our faith? and wanting to share it with others. If we could, could we replicate ourselves a thousand times to go and share with all of those who we know and love and don't know and don't love the difficult to reach, the disenfranchised? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Our great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace, that willingness to reach out and to engage with us. And then, of course, the second verse. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim. Not proclaim on my behalf, assist me to proclaim. To spread through all the earth abroad. Did John Wesley think when he arrived in the city of Bristol at the end of March 1739, the work that I will begin here will not only define my ministry, it will become a worldwide church. Do you think John thought that? No. But what he was open to was allowing the spirit to work through him in the way that God wanted to work through him. Assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Now, I don't know your individual stories. I don't know where you come from. And I certainly don't know where you're going. But what I do know is that God wants to use you, each one of us, in that work and that ministry. And if we would truly want to look upon all the world as our parish, we've got to be open to God working through us fulfilling what he has given us to do. So the challenge I would lay with you at the end of this short time together is how are you in your daily walk seeking to follow God's will in your life, the calling that he has upon it? Rhetorical question. There is a glorious door opened. You, you, you must come and water what God has enabled me to plant. Thank you. I visited uh, in London, I was really surprised that this tune was not sung to Oh Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. But in honor of your visit here, we'll try another tune.
very end of the service. God has work for us to do. I'm quite a bit shorter. <laughs> thanks, Dick Young. And thanks for inspiring a song, among other things. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give God our thanks. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join this unending hymn. are you and blessed is your child Jesus Christ your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people he healed the sick fed the hungry and ate with sinners and probably savages on the night in which he gave himself up for us he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your grace-filled acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by this love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever.
food for the journey. The cup that saves and sets us free. Everyone is welcome here. The table is set, and you may come as the Spirit calls you. It's gluten-free wafers will be offered today. There is juice on this jug and wine in this one. Um, please come down the center aisle to be served. I'll invite those who are assisting to come forward.